A very good afternoon to one and all, and a very warm welcome to all our esteemed guests present here. We're here today to be a part of TAC Trivandrum Arthroplasty course 2017. Please make yourselves comfortable as we welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ross Crawford, all the way from Australia. Hey, Peter. Uh, hello, Ross. Th this is Vijay Bose. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, can you hear us? Vijay Bose, I yeah. Can yeah, can you hear me? Can hear you very well, Ross, yeah. Perfect. Is that Vijay? Yeah, it, it's Vijay, yeah. Hey, how are you? I can't see you, so I had to guess. Uh, I picked your dulcet tones. Yeah, y you look good, Ross. Yeah, yeah, we're ready to kick off, yeah. So tell me the plan. Around 30 minutes? Yeah. He has it, he has a presentation, yeah. that's it. Yeah, I, I, I believe you have a presentation you're going to show yeah. us. Yeah, it's up on the screen. Um, we're not able to see that. Uh, oh. Oh, this one. Okay. We got on the screen, Ross. Yeah. Okay. All right. I am going to need to ask someone to press next as we go when I, when I ask, if that's okay. Okay. We'll do that for you. Yeah. All right. So, um, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you, but um, it's nice to be able to connect. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the um, Mako hip... Um, technology um, and talk a bit about the Exeter hip in, in particular. So we can go to the next slide. Um, my conflict of interest is that I do receive royalties on the sale of the Exeter hip, but I have no conflicts with the Mako robotic system. The world of orthopedics and surgery and medicine in general is changing. And much as we're seeing driverless cars, we're seeing an incredible revolution in robotic technology, we're going to see it in orthopedic surgery in the future. In fact, all surgery in the future. And if you're at my stage of your life in your career, you're probably okay. But if you're a younger surgeon, you're really going to have to understand and adopt this sort of technology. And in some ways, this is going to be a huge leg up for India. Some of this technology is going to allow rapid um, uptake of new skills and allow a lot of surgery to be performed more simply than it currently is now. And we're seeing it in Australia is this gap between the private and the public sector where all of the robotic and expensive technologies going into the private, the private sector and only when we get this technology into the government type hospitals will we really start to see benefits of, of the new technology. So the next slide. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about current technology and where we've come from. Some very, very minimal preliminary data on the hip. Talk a little bit about the surgical technique with the Mako hip system. And in the last few minutes, just a few thoughts on the future and where we may end up with all of this. So ro robotic hip surgery is not new. In 1986, the RoboDoc was introduced. It was very popular in Germany in particular. 
And that's, what, 30, 30 years old now. So robotic surgery is not particularly new to us. Um, RoboDoc was not a great success, and most RoboDocs ended up in the basement of the hospital, and the big advantage was that the hospital could say that they owned a robotic hip system. And if you look at the next slide, a lot of words, and I'll let you read it, but essentially the surgery was really not a great success. It probably wasn't true robotic surgery, and the da Vinci system is certainly not robotic surgery, and there's some argument that the Mako is only a little bit robotic if we actually think about what's truly robotic or autonomous. But you can see it's been an evolution from a um, technology that really didn't do much to, to what we have today. So next. If you go to a major meeting like the American Academy or you go to any of the big meetings now, people don't talk about implants very much. The, the implant market is very mature. We're not seeing radical new hip or knee replacements. We're seeing little changes around the edges. But the next big step is not going to be implants. People are talking about two things in particular. Approaches, and we won't go there today, but we're hearing about direct anterior, direct superior, spare approach, the, the, all these different ways of approaching the hip. And we're hearing about robotics. And we're hearing about different alignment techniques, different ways of more accurately placing our hip replacements. Around Mako's not new. It's been around for many years. It was a US company based out of Florida. And about three years ago, Stryker bet 1.3 billion US dollars, which is a lot of crore rupees, on the Mako technology. They actually bought 270 patents that Mako owned and they have a robot system that in a few years we'll look back at and say was pretty um, clunky, was, uh, and this will not look like what robots look in the future. But at the moment, it's the state of the art and it is a really good and interesting technology. And I'll talk to you a little bit about more, more about exactly what it offers and, and how we go about it. So um, we've been doing robotic hip for about um, 18 months now. We are using it with the Exeter hip exclusively and I'm going to run through in the next little bit how we actually go about doing it and where the technology might help. So next slide. Now, the whole Lewinic safe zone is made up. There's, it's a really bad paper. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a safe zone. But what this slide does show is surgeons can't put their acetabular components where they want to. Um, they have problems with leg length. They have problems with offset. They have problems particularly with cup version and um, inclination, and this is something that could potentially be improved with robotic technology. Next. 
So if we think about a hip replacement and the steps we take as surgeons, a robot help. If we thought generally what it could add, we would say it could make more accurate and safer reaming. It could potentially make more accurate and safer component positioning. Better planning for leg length, version and offset. Ultimately, it could create improved component placement and potentially even cementing. And in the future, it may allow us to plan an individual patient's anatomy, where the cup would sit relative to the femur to allow the best range of motion to impingement and potentially calculate where our components could go to give the best range of motion and the best matching of components. Next. How does the current system help? Really just with the first three, and more so with the first two. And as I'll show you and explain, it's really the cup at the moment where we're seeing the most value, but with time, we're going to see a great ability to place our femoral components exactly where we'd like to place them. And we'll be able to place our hips in the position that we want. As I'll discuss probably a couple of times, the problem now is we don't, in fact, know where to put our hips. We can put them where we want to put them, but do we truly know what the right place to put an implant is for any person? But ultimately, this technology will allow us to understand that and potentially um, individualise component placement. Next. There's a little bit of early data on the uh, MAKO and it's coming more regularly. But essentially what it shows is you can put your cup where you want to put your cup. The blue dots outside this black square are not misplaced components. That's actually where the surgeon decided they want to place their components. And I find that I tend to place my component relative to the patient's natural anatomy, which I can um, determine both preoperatively and intraoperatively. And so you can, as I said to you before, you can put it where you want to put it, but are we putting it exactly where it should be put? And again, only time will tell. Next. And next button. So these say pretty much the same thing. That essentially using a robot allows you to put your cup where you want to put your cup. If you just press the button a couple of times, you'll see a few more bits of data. Next. Next. So, how does it work? Um, I know that most of you now don't have access to robotic technology, but I believe that the first systems have been introduced into India, and I think, given my understanding of how the Indian orthopedic climate works, that it will become a relatively um, widespread technology in the next five to ten years. So if you look at the next slide, there's a, a little flow that I'll give you a broad introduction to, and then we'll come back and look at each piece in a bit more detail. The, the key is the planning, and the planning is where we determine component positioning, where we understand the system, it's based on a patient's 
CT, the patient's own anatomy, and much of it's done by the company representatives, but ultimately it's done by the surgeon. There are landmarks placed in the femur and the acetabulum of the pelvis. We use a pelvic array to essentially allow us to track the pelvis as it moves. There's a series of digitization points to map the acetabulum to the CT scan. And then there's cup reaming, which is robotically assisted, cup impaction, which is controlled by the robot. And then the femoral preparation and reduction is at the moment still more in the hands of the surgeon than the robot itself. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that the first thing we do is to create a plan. The patient has a CT scan that's sent to a specialist who produces a 3D model of the pelvis and the femur. And that model then allows us to execute some preoperative planning. Next. There's a little bit of work to be done on plan creation, but essentially the um, specialists use CT marks to plan for offset and for leg length. And Using these points, they then generate uh, a prosthesis that fits the acetabulum and the femur. And you'll see on the next slide, we can use this x-ray view, which allows us to, to manipulate the, the dart much like we did with our own x-rays, to then um, create our plan. So the next slide shows you the acetabular plan. And this is really to me at the moment where the value of the system is created. You can see on your right there's a this cup is inclined at 40 degrees and it's antiverted at 20 degrees. And you can set that as your default position if you wish, which means the plan will come to you in a, with the cup always at that position on your, um, the first time you have a look at your component positioning. And you can see in that position that the cup is uncovered posteriorly and it's buried um, anteriorly. Oh, sorry, that's the other way around. So what I would do here is I would change the version, take some antiversion out of the cup to make it fit the patient's natural anatomy. And on the top left, the cup is probably a little bit lateralized and you may choose to slightly medialize this cup in your plan. What I did for my first 20 cases was deliberately undersize the cup and leave it a little bit lateral to where I thought it was going to go so that I learned to trust the system because it won't let you ream outside that green envelope. Once you get beyond that point, it will turn you off. So your junior doctor, your learning surgeon will never go through the medial wall, will never take out the anterior or posterior wall and can never put the cup anywhere except where it's been planned. And this will be interesting because I, I think in some of the high volume centers, you could see that a very experienced hip surgeon may plan the operation and then allow others to execute the operation knowing the robot will only allow you to execute it exactly as that planning surgeon has said. The pink dot is the center of rotation. 
and that locks your rema and only lets you ream around that center of rotation. So you create a perfect hemisphere as you ream. So that, that's your cup planning on that, next, that view. The next view shows you, you can spin around and look at here. We see, as I said, the cup is a bit uncovered, so you might take a bit of version out to try and get it covered. And you can just swing this around in real time to see exactly where you want to put your acetabular component. And you can see on the bottom we've taken five degrees of version out of the system to put the cup exactly how it fits in at Next. It's still a bit of work to do, but ultimately we'll be able to plan in complex cases to hopefully go to a single ream that will allow us to prepare an acetabulum, even in a really complex case such as this, very, very safely without that fear of knowing exactly where you are. Rather than in these cases where you've got to find the true floor, find the fat in the phobia, get under the transverse ligament, to be able to digitize the pelvis, place a ream and go bam, and with a single ream, it should cup in exactly the right position. So it's going to make us much better surgeons, particularly in difficult cases. Next. The femur is still not as well sorted as the acetabulum. That will come with time. But you can see the femoral version is the native version of the femoral neck. And this component positioning that we've determined has showed us that we will, how we will lengthen our hip, how we will change the offset of the hip compared to the pre-op and the post-op hip. And this is a very nice way of ultimately being able to plan and template our hips to produce a perfect reconstruction of the anatomy. So this is another planning step that's done before we went into the operating theatre. Next. And then there's a series of views you can get that allow you to, to look at what you'd end up with once you've done it. This, this view um, shows you a sort of cartoon form, how your hip would look compared to um, the other hip and how it would look compared to the, the same hip once the implants were placed, we had planned to place them. Next. And this x-ray view allows you to um, look at how your components would look if they were placed where you planned to place them. And again, allow you to decide exactly how it should look. Next. You can use any approach with the robot, there are um, different algorithms to digitize the socket for both the posterior lateral and up subsequently you know, direct superior, spare, any direct anterior, anterolateral, or the um, anterior approach as well. And many of the anterior surgeons who use very small incisions and are using uh, fluoroscopy are finding this is an amazing change to their technique because they can get rid of the fluoroscope and with a single ring um, prepare the acetabulum much more safely than multiple passes with reamers and fluoroscopy. Next. So once all the planning's done, the execution is relatively fluid. In this picture you see an in-wound tracker. I tend to use an iliac crest tracker, um, and I'll talk to you a bit more about that. You're seeing an array on the femur, the one you're pointing at now, which is used for the enhanced um, workflow, and the blue tracker is what the surgeon uses, no, back to your left, the blue, the blue tracker above the surgeon's hand is used to digitize points and map the anatomy 
to the CT scan. Next. Um, for the express workflow, which is what most surgeons use, you place a tracker in the proximal femur, a tracker on the knee, we tend to use an ECG dot, and then a tracker in the pelvis to allow you to basically, um, it's more of a checkpoint, just to make sure that um, things haven't moved while you're doing your surgery. Next. The top left shows the pelvic, you're, you're just checking your, your femoral tracker, or your femoral checkpoint. You see the acetabular checkpoint, just superior to the acetabulum below that. And the top right shows the image that you're given to capture these points. And the surgeon captures these points to allow the um, robot to match patient's anatomy to the CT scan. And that allows it to then know exactly where it is. And no matter where the patient moves, it will then be able to follow the patient as the procedure continues. Following the digitization at the top, once that's completed, you'll see a picture as you see on the bottom right where you have a series of green dots and blue bubbles. And the green dots show that you've done a good job with your data capture. And then you go ahead and cap blue dots again to validate your um, digitization. Once that's completed, you now have the patient's anatomy digitized and you're ready to go to the next step. And uh, You then go into your reading field, you see this green on, and your aim is to remove the green. And you do that by placing the reamer, reaming, and as you remove the green, it goes white. And it says to you that you're removing bone and that you're reaching the point where you will be able to post the tablet. Next slide shows you the reamer that is guided by the robot. It allows you to move in an arc of about five to ten degrees, but it captures your center of rotation, which means you're reaming incredibly accurately, and it is very noticeable how much more solid the cut placement is when you ream with the robotic arm rather than reaming. Um, with reaming freehand. The next slide shows that as you ream, the green is being um, removed as bone is removed. And the next slide, you can see there's a little bit of red. The green vanishes. The red allows you to ream, if you ream a millimetre beyond the boundary constraint, you will go red. If you try to go any further, the robot will turn you off. So it's impossible to ream outside the boundary to which the robot is constraining. So you could give your reamer to the house officer, to the most junior surgeon, ask them to ream a socket, and you could sit back and relax because you know they cannot get it wrong. Possible to ream outside the plan that you've created. Next. That's just a picture of the reaming. Next. And then the surgeon impacts the acetabular component. What you do is you put the cup on the robotic arm, you put the cup into the surgical field, you press a button and the robot captures the cup and it only allows you to place the cup exactly where you plan to place it. If you plan 4515, it will place the cup at 4515. It cannot go anywhere but that. Next. And the surgeon 
is hitting, but really the robot's in control. Um, and in fact, the surgeon's probably the robot's robot, if you think about it. And there's no doubt in the future that the robot will impact the cup. It will be able to tell from a change in resistance, from a change in pitch, from a change in um, whatever um, technique it uses, it will be able to tell you that that cup is perfectly placed and perfectly stable and perfectly solid. We would also be able to predict if another blow was likely to lead to acetabular fracture and is going to decrease risk of over-impaction or acetabular um, complications. Next. Next. And there are different techniques to actually check that your cup's going into the right position. And if you're using ceramic liners, which I don't, and you're having trouble seating them, you can actually digitize the ceramic liner to make sure it's in the same position as the acetabular component to show you that the cup is, in fact, seated. Or the line is seated in the cup. Next. As I said, the femur is not quite so good, and there's a lot of work to be done there. But most people are using for the enhanced workflow, which allows you to check your leg length and your offset, but you're not the robot's not helping you do your femoral preparation. It's only checking what you've achieved. Next. The enhanced workflow, um, as you can see here, allows you to look at broach version, um, head length, and then you look at your um, hip length offset, and um, and you can look at your version. My little plug to the Exeter is that in the US, nobody uses this because once you've planned for an implant and you go uncemented, it goes where it goes. So you hit your size 2 femoral component in and it goes into antiversion or retroversion or it goes into whatever offset or leg length and you can't do anything about it. So nobody's been thinking about offset or version particularly because they can't control it. Next. Next. And um, again, this shows you what you get with the enhanced system. You get your cup inclination and version at the top. You can get combined version and, and broach version. Again, I don't think we know what the true range of combined version should be, but you can achieve what you want to achieve, particularly if you use the cement and stuff. Next. So, why would Exeter, which is 47 years old this year, be the perfect hit to use with the robot? What is the advantage that we, um, we're seeing? And it, it's interesting that the engineers were in the US who hadn't been exposed to this, actually went, this is the stem that in a way has been designed for robotic. The reason being, if you go to the next slide, is that what you do with the Exeter and any cemented polished stem is you create a volume of cement, you, you fill the proximal femur with cement, you then put your stem of chosen version in any position up or down to determine leg length and you can control your version. So you're not dictated by the anatomy of the femur. You can put the stem exactly where you want to put it. And in a few years, we'll see the robot potentially doing the cementing and putting the stem exactly where you want to do it. You're not constrained by the femoral neck, antiversion or retroversion, but the anatomy will allow you to put the stem anywhere you want. Next. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Exeter. It has an offset from 30 millimeters through to 56 millimeters. And 
you can preoperatively choose your offset. So once you've templated, the robot has helped you choose your offset, you're not going to change that interoperatively. You'll put your stem up or down where you want to put it to get your leg lap, and you'll put it in whatever version you want to get your version. Next. And just an example to show you that the anatomy of the proximal femur does not necessarily dictate where you're going to put a cementic stem. You could not do this with a cementless system, and you're able to create this window, cut your neck where you want to cut it, put your, choose your offset, and put your stem where you want to put it. Next. So that's where we're at now. We will look back on the first generation Mako in 10 years, and we'll think it was pretty primitive. Much like we look back on the early iPhone, we look back on an early desktop, we look back on um, the Apollo missions, which have less computing power than your iPhone. But this is the start. This is the start of the future. And if we don't get on board, we're going to be left behind. In the next generation, we'll have autonomous registration, where the robot will register the bone for us, probably much, much quicker than we can. It will ream independently, and it will do cut placement independently, where all the surgeon may do is expose the hip and sit back, and the robot will take over. It will ultimately do cement insertion, and for a cemented hip, it could do stem insertion. We'll probably see the RoboDoc concept come back and the robot will burr the femur to accept an uncemented stem and then insert the uncemented stem in the envelope created by that burr. And then ultimately, and one of the things we're working on at QUT is we'll be able to do soft tissue tracking and then we'll be able to do the whole operation with the robot. Next. So just to highlight that um, this is what we see now, but the, the planning, the reaming, the, the removal of bone, the, the, the whole operation could ultimately be done completely by the robot on the bony part of the work. Next. The soft tissue remains a problem. You can't actually um, use preoperative imaging to then follow soft tissue because it moves. But the next time you do a hip or a knee replacement, if you have a look, it's actually pretty easy to define what's what. And now that we have robotic vision, and that may be vision as we think of vision, maybe ultrasound, it may be other um, ways of tracking tissue. Ultimately, um, the robots will be able to, to do the soft tissue dissection and tracking as well. Next. So the future will be robotic. It's not going to happen overnight. The robotic people talk about singularity, which is where a robot takes over completely. But the belief is for that, that a group of people who understand robotic technology will become the dominant player. And I think that's what will happen in surgery. The people who really get this and really understand it and really use it will start to become dominant and the human involvement will gradually decrease. And surgeons may not even do surgery. They may be done by um, engineers, it may be done by technicians, who are just trained to use the robots and to do the surgery. And really, do we need many, many years of undergraduate training, postgraduate training, fellowship training to come down and be a robotic hip or robotic knee surgeon? Or do we just need to train someone over 12 months and do the procedure? So I think there's some threats for us surgeons. Um, and I think the surgeons of the future we don't embrace this sort of technology. And look, it may not be Mako. It may be something that comes out of left field that, that just takes it over. But you've got to be aware 
you've got to keep an eye on this. You've got to try and understand it. And if you don't, I think as a surgeon, you'll be left behind. I'm hopeless with computers. I'm hopeless with technology. But I'm very much a fan of this sort of technology because it's very easy for us to use as surgeons. I think it makes the operation safer. Ultimately, it will make it quicker. And um, ultimately, most of us will be using this in some form in our surgery. I think the next slide is... I thank you, slide. So thank you for your attention. And I hope I got... Uh, th th thanks, Ross. That was excellent. Uh, very exciting technology indeed. I uh, will open the floor for questions. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Ross, can I ask you, in your experience, how many times have you abandoned the robot and uh, resorted to manual uh, technique? Um, never. Never. All right. Great. Never with a hip or a, a uni. Um, the thing with the hip is you can. It's very easy to be able to do it. So, um, but we haven't had to we haven't had to abandon it in any, in any cases yet. Uh, Ross Suri here. Hey Suri. Uh, how do you factor the bone quality when you impact the cup? I mean, sometimes you know you do find that the tissues is no great, and you need to be careful. I mean, in terms of sizing, yes, it will do it. Um, look again, you're still holding the um, you're still holding it as you impact it. So you're, you're still getting the feel. And Sir, so you'll be very pleased to know that I still only use the robot in about 30% of my hips because I cement the cup in 70% of my hips. So any of that soft osteoporotic bone, I'm cementing my, my cup, and so I don't have to worry about soft osteoporotic bone. But you but you can't, you're, you're holding it and you're doing the impacting, so you're still getting the same feeling as you would without the, um, without the robot. It's just guiding you in that, in, it's constraining your direction, not how hard you impact. Any, any other? What, what are you drinking there, Ross? White wine? South Australian white wine? Uh, no, that's a, that's a little um, a water with a little dash of white wine, yes. No, <laughs> no, we are in the dry state of Kerala, that's why we are envying you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> any other questions? I'm Jacob here. I just want to ask you, can you factor in the spine position onto, your, onto the position of the acetabulum? Because that's one of the issues we have now, isn't it? Um, look, that's the, six, that's the thing that's keeping people awake at night, is that um, there's all these different people looking at um, patient specific. They're looking at standing and lying views. They're looking at uh, patient positioning views, they're looking at individual spine. You can do it, but no one knows what the right answer is. That's the problem. But how the, the patient's spine is affecting cup position is something that's being looked at. So you'll be able to very much individualize your um, cup placement with time around a patient's anatomy. But again, no one truly knows what it means, I don't think. Ross, are you time neutral now? Or is Wait. in terms of the surgical time, exposure time and the performance time? Yeah, it's about time neutral because now that I do a single ream, um, that's a lot quicker. And my fellow puts in the pelvic track, uh, the pelvic array while I'm doing my um, exposure. And so really it it, at most, it might be five, ten minutes, but it, it's really pretty close to time neutral now. Uh, the pelvis is a very dynamic move, moving target. How will you uh, get that into your system? Once you, once you digitize the pelvis, and you could put the patient upside down on the floor, and the robot knows where the pelvis is. So one of the, um, you're very right, that when we're doing a conventional hip, once we put in a um, anterior retractor, for example, the pelvis might come forward. But once digitized it, as I said, you really, you could 
tilt the patient 15 degrees forward and the robot will just come 15 degrees forward with it, follow the pelvis, because it knows at all times exactly where it is. And so that's a huge advantage for patients moving around on, on the table. Secondly, uh, we, uh, we know that these the safe positions are required to reduce the wear, to give a better function. I do I agree totally. But we are all uh, talking on everything is on static alignment. Uh, what happens really in a functional when the patients are moving around? We really still don't know. Oh, look, I, I entirely agree with you. What this technology allows you to do is put the cup where you want to put it. It can't, it can't tell you what is right for that patient. Um, I use, mostly I use the patient's um, native antiversion because I believe that if it's impingement, range of motion, impingement, dislocation, so I won't bury my cup and then have it proud anteriorly, posteriorly. But you, you're entirely correct. And it's the same with the total knee system that is now in the beta version. You can put your knee anywhere you want. Three degrees of, any, of, of um, rotation, internal or external, you can put it in a bit of flexion. But do we do kinematic? Do we do... We don't know. So this is the technology that allows us to put it there. And what will happen is once we get this data capture, ultimately we'll be able to follow all the cases and we'll learn with time, I think, what is the right position. But, but you're right, it's opened up a whole new can of worms. But what it does do is let you put it where you think you should put it. Uh, Ross, I believe uh, you have moved on to non cemented uh, cups. 30%. Sorry, what is that? 30%. 30% of the time. When you use the robot probably? Or yeah, so I only use, I only use the robot for um, cementless cups. Um, but about 70% of my cups are still cemented. Right. We, we look forward to the day when you'll use the non cemented stems as well. No, no, that'll never happen. <laughs> The robot is even, what is actually shown, and it's quite embarrassing for the Americans, is it actually shows that the femoral component goes where it wants to go, and the robot's saying that you can't put it where you want to put it, and so the emperor has no clothes, they're, they're, they're struggling, right. and you'll see no papers with femoral data because it's going in whatever retroversion the, asset, the native neck makes it. And if it's a size 2 femur, it's a size 2 femur. And you can't do anything about it. So, VJ, you'll be very pleased to know you now have a way of actually restoring anatomy perfectly. And I look forward to you becoming a cemented man. Right. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how this uh, robotic surgery differs from uh, the navigation technique what we are following on and off here? Robotic surgery get? differs from... This Sorry? Uh, navigation. What is this better than navigation? Yeah. How um, it differs. The, uh, the problem with hip nav from the posterior approach in particular is you can't digitize the opposite ASIS. And so it's very difficult to get accurate points. What it does do, apart from more accurate registration, is allow the navigation doesn't allow you to control your reaming or your cup placement. The navigation allows you to to look at the screen, but this just does it a little bit more accurately. So it's it's the next level up from navigation, I guess. Um, DAA you could probably use navigation a bit a bit um, more accurately, but it, it and it allows you to control your cup positioning. But the reaming the reaming is the main thing that's controlled by um, by the robot. So you, you can ream much more safely than when you navigate. Uh, I think uh, that's all from here, Ross. It was a great experience for us uh, to get a... Oops, is he still there? Yeah, yeah, still here. Yeah, yeah so it was a great uh, talk and a great um, sort of introduction to robotic for all of us here. Thanks very much.
for staying up uh, late. What time is it in Sydney now? Uh, Brisbane, it's only 7.30, so it's no problem. <laughs> all right, okay. Good. All Thanks right. very much, Ross. Have a good... Yeah, nice to talk to you all. Yeah, have a good drink. A good Thank day. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, BJ. Bye. Bye then. Bye. Thanks very much.